Okay, welcome to our quick review lecture of core periphery model. And there's um, really two slides beside the cover slide here. One slide that's a world map that was uh, originally designed to accompany the book Cultural Landscape, and then one slide that's quick content review that talks or that I designed myself. So uh, part of what I love about this map, and it's a polar view map, is that you can basically draw a circle around the global core. And you can see the line there between more developed and less developed very, very clearly. And it's a great visual because you think about the core, you kind of think about the center of things, right? And that's what core countries are. So they're the center of global economic activity. Uh, and then everything that's not core is less developed or is some form of, of periphery. Okay, And the model itself comes from Emmanuel Wallerstein. Again, remember, you need to remember that and basically looks at kind of the structure of the world economy and why things are the way they are. So just some real quick content review, some traits of each of these levels of countries. So our core countries, they are going to be more developed. They're wealthier countries. They were the earliest to industrialize. By now, they largely have a tertiary-based economy and increasingly high level. It's either high level or low level tertiary based economy. So people are either working and doing information processing and management type services or they're working in that low level like bag your groceries at the grocery store. There's fewer and fewer people that are kind of in the middle. Core countries also, just don't get back to some of the other stuff we've been studying, have low or no population growth. Um, in part because they are so wealthy and healthcare is better and things like that, that it really means that countries can afford to have fewer kids and it's increasingly expensive to have individual kids. Okay, our semi-periphery countries, these are mid-level countries. They have a pretty reasonable standard of living. It's not awesome everywhere, right? But it's pretty good. It's pretty good. People generally have enough food. They're able to get the things that they need to survive, right? They have access to some of the extra bonuses that come with being more developed, right? Cars and things like that. And these countries were either later to industrialize or are in the process of industrializing. Okay, so there are various levels along there. Um, and they do have some, some folks, increasingly fewer, engaged in primary activities. A lot of folks engaged in secondary economic activities, so they're doing manufacturing, things like that. And slowly but surely, increasingly, they're engaging in that tertiary economy, that service-based economy. Um, population is still, in most of these countries, rapidly growing, but it's, or sorry, not rapidly growing. It's growing, but it's rapidly slowing. That's what I meant to see, say. And there's always going to be counterexamples, right? We could talk about China as a semi-periphery country and its rapid population drop and decline. We talk about South Korea the same way, right? But if we talk about countries like, say, Brazil, populations growing but slowing. Um, and then we've got at our lowest level of development our periphery countries. And so, um, their standard of living is a lot lower. Okay, it's still, depending on exactly where you're at in the country, you might have enough to eat, you might not. You might not be able to get access to some of those basics that you need, right, to live or to improve your life. Things like education, for example. Um, and these are countries that are trying to industrialize, they're trying to improve. And oftentimes the way that they're doing that is they're seeking to move people out of that primary economy, out of... Um, largely, especially subsistence agriculture, and into that secondary economy. So that what they're trying to do is develop their manufacturing sector, oftentimes slowly but surely. And occasionally you see countries that are trying to leapfrog that secondary development, or quite frankly, that might end up just having to leapfrog the secondary development. So for instance, a lot of Africa, there I've seen talk in the last year or two, might actually go straight from um, a pr a mostly primary um, economic activity-based uh, economy into more of a services-based economy just because um, the global, because the vagaries of global demand, right? And these countries, they still have reasonably high population growth, but it's slowing um, dramatically, but not as dramatically as what we see in the semi-periphery countries. 
Okay, so again, what we've looked at in our quick review, right, core periphery model. We went back, and I'm going to flip back real quick Oops. and take a quick look at the world map here again. Global core, middle of the map, right, North America, Europe. These are areas you'd expect. The global periphery, pretty much everywhere else. Australia is kind of a funky case in that because of their close ties to Europe, they actually are part of the global core as well. And then we also talked a little bit about traits of various um, countries depending on where they're at. Again, this is a structural theory, so it's based on describing what is the structure of the world. Doesn't It's not predictive. It's not telling us where are people going. Right? It's just saying, here's what we see. Here's the structure that we see. And so it's possible, theoretically at least, that a core country could become a periphery country, or a periphery country could become a core country, without going through or going through a very short phase there in the middle. It's not likely, but the theory doesn't speak to whether or not a country could do that. So if you have questions about core periphery model, or if you'd um, like to follow up, please feel free to come and see me, and I'd be delighted to discuss any questions you have. And I will see you the next time class meets.